so to more, uh, to more. <laughs> this morning, um, our session is how two Microsoft engineers, that's us, um, build blockchain enterprise applications. Um, so, the two of us today, we've got Kale Tita. Hello. Hello. So if any of you are using some of the cool stuff that we have up on Azure inside of the Studio Code, uh, Kale is part of the product group. So the product group are the ones that started at Microsoft that build all the cool tools that everyone can use. Um, me, um, I'm in a different section of Microsoft called uh, Commercial Software Engineering. So, um, so I go out and I work with Microsoft uh, like 500 customers and um, our division helps them do really cool shit using the stuff that they do. Um, so we go out and work with these customers. So what I do is I help these big customers go and build blockchain applications. Um, so this session is a mixture of uh, me going through some of the architecture that I use, um, some of the architecture that I use when I'm creating these enterprise applications, uh, what do we talk to these um, enterprises about, how do we architect it. Um, click over to Kale, he'll walk through the, some of the Visual Studio tooling and how that can be used to accelerate building blockchain applications. Uh, we'll flip back to me and I'll cover off, now that you understand some of those building blocks, how we can go and compose these together having a typical application. <coughs> so, uh, let's cover off the one that I usually get at conferences like this, but, which is usually why the fuck do we need public, uh, private blockchain? If we have public, everything should be public. Um, so, cover off what you all should already know, public Ethereum, we can't trust anyone. Um, so because of that, the security things that I built into it are all around just assuming that everyone is trying to dick us over. So everyone is controlling their own keys, we, um, we've all got um, trustless infrastructure because we don't know who the bad actors are. So everything has to be security around the bad actors trying to do things to us. Which is okay, but when we're inside of a private network, we have different security considerations to worry about. Um, and usually um, with the web UI and application front end, usually this type of stuff is deployed out to a decentralized file system. Now, that's great for that type of scenario, but for consumer to consumer apps, that's great. For inside of the enterprise space, um, these are usually the three things that they're worried about. Um, enterprises think that they have really, really large transaction volumes, so they always say the public Ethereum, public blockchains can't handle our uh, transactions. We want to do something faster. So because we have different um, security considerations, um, we can relax some of these things. So we can go and move to things like proof of authority where we can get some of these high transaction volumes. So that's one consideration, but it's usually not the main reason that we end up using private chain. The, the two main reasons um, are usually scared of the unknown. We've got these large enterprises with um, all, of their, um, all of their developers and they want to go do something blockchain-y, but they're afraid of failing. And they don't want to fail publicly, because that would be bad. Um, so they want to have a nice um, safe space that they can go uh, deploy some things, play with it, uh, get the developers through the motion of how to build these things. And then once um, in a few years, once they're more happy, then they'll start moving into the B to C space. Um, the other one is maturity of private transactions. Um, a lot of the things that these enterprises are doing in a B2B scenario is commercially sensitive. Um, and right now in um, public Ethereum, and, um, doing some of these private transactions is harder. Now there are some cool things happening with ZK Snarks. Um, Ernst Young have, have just released Nightfall. So we're looking at Nightfall to help um, integrate Nightfall into some of what we're doing. But as it is, these are the three main reasons why we end up using our private networks. So if we look at a private enterprise network, it kind of looks like this. So instead of having unknown actors, we've got a private service. So we know who the actors are. And then because of this, we can relax some of these security considerations just a little bit. So it goes from having, trying to do this in a trustless, decentralized way to more of a, how can we go and use a blockchain as a shared source of truth so we've all got the same understanding of what um, the data is. Um, and for that, they now are able to accelerate the business of business applications. Um, so it's usually, um, that's another reason why we do it like this. They have their um, three separate um, deployments. Each enterprise has their own back end, uh, uh, etc. It's because although they're going to be here with a common goal, hey, we want to be able to track these widgets more efficiently uh, between us. Our company A want to do all their reporting.
reporting is going to be a completely different cloud company. We want to have an internal internet application uh, hooking up to all of this. Now, that's a well and good. So, typically, how an engagement happens when I get called in is um, we talk to the enterprise, and when we ask them, do you know about blockchain? They always go, yeah, yeah, I read Forbes magazine, I know all about the blockchains. <laughs> and so because they are a large traditional enterprise, they've got all of their legacy applications created. So they've usually got a traditional multi-tier application. So if we go with a typical um, thing, it'll be one really large company um, with multiple um, vendors which go and interact with them. So making up names, these are not real companies. Let's just go with Walmart, because everyone knows that, and suppliers to Walmart. So typically what, what would happen, Walmart's the largest player in the space. Um, all of the suppliers are going and supplying packages to them. But because Walmart's a big player in here, they can go and dictate to all of these other players. All of you are going to log into our front-end web portal. All of you are going to update into there. So Walmart in the back end have their business tier. They've got their data tier, the database, a traditional free tier application, and they might have some analytics and reporting and stuff. So because I've already got all of this in, uh, legacy enterprise infrastructure, that almost every single time that fails, they go, we want to make this more secure by making it on blockchain instead. So all they do is they take that database <coughs> and they they replace that with blockchain. And they go, it's now more secure because it's on blockchain. And we tell them, no, you've just made it worse. Um, you, you've made it, you've taken the worst parts of both. So all of them have got now their exact same application, which is now a whole lot slower than what their SQL database was. Um, and then they, um, sorry, and everything is now behind a firewall. So none of these party, parties can even access that blockchain. So I asked them, so are you going, who else is going to host this blockchain? No one. We control the blockchain. It doesn't work like that, guys. Um, so then we say, okay, so if you're not going to even let them host it, then are you going to let them have like a direct um, endpoint to the blockchain so they can at least verify? Oh, no, no, it's behind our firewall. So you guys are running a blockchain. You're, um, you're running the blockchain. You're the only one hosting the node, and it's hitting behind a firewall that no one can access. So what, uh, you can't prove anything. Because right now, it may be secured in a blockchain, but they can't tell. Because whenever it comes here in transit, it can still be modified in any of these data tiers before it gets up to here. So the biggest thing that, um, the biggest challenge we have with enterprises is that education around um, every, every single party has to be able to access the blockchain directly to verify it. If you're still going through a centralized access point like this, then it has absolutely no value is always a big struggle because the largest player here wants to still lock down and control everything. So trying to get them to understand you can't control the blockchain, everyone needs to host it, that's usually a scary uh, thing for them. So the common mistakes I usually see, what we just saw, um, they have a 3 tier application, they used to, they are the ones who control everything, host everything for the industry. They want to use the blockchain as a database, try and get them moving with their mindset out of we have a database that we control to we have a shared state, a shared understanding between all parties, that's the biggest mind shift. But once we get them through that, it usually takes about two days. Once they do it and it clicks, then you can see them get excited because now they understand um, the possibilities of it. Um, and this is still a big problem. The largest company usually still wants to control it. That's um, more of a business problem. So, how we go about helping to educate them, um, we get them to go that um, blockchain is the source of truth. So it's no longer your backend back systems are the source of truth, what is in the blockchain is the source of truth, which again is another mindset, mindset shift for enterprise um, developers. Get them to understand that their backend systems are going to react to what just happened in, um, in the blockchain via oracles, that again is another mindset shift. So try and tell them, Nothing's confirmed until you've sent it into the shared state. The shared state is updated and it's come back via an Oracle so you can update your backend to your reporting systems. Um, each party controls their own infrastructure. Um, 
this one is from where we've seen uh, many projects fail. We'd have um, one party, uh, one company inside of an industry say, we're going to go and create the blockchain for supply chain, the blockchain for Apple, the blockchain for whatever. So every time we've seen one company say, we're going to create the blockchain and then we're going to roll it out to our partners, it has failed every single time. I've never seen that work. The way that we've seen it work is when um, they get us engaged, we'll go in and we'll say, we're only going to be working with you if you bring in at least two other parties um, for our next meeting. Once we go in there and we've got at least three companies who are going to be part of that initial development, that initial deployment, then we start to see these be a lot more successful. Um, because at that point we do have three companies who have all had their input into the business processes, into the development, it's been deployed out to their three, um, uh, their Azure subscriptions, um, so it gets rolling on from there. And most, most importantly, everything that we're teaching them is applicable to public blockchains. So everything we're teaching them around uh, key security, around DAP development, oracles, etc., works inside of the private space. But my secret agenda is to get them all upskilled so that once they're happy within the B2B space, they can take everything that they've learned and start doing things in B2C and public Ethereum. So we're talking to them around, sure, we could have a private network, but why not make it a plasma chain? So it's connected to the public networks, we can do some more things easier from there. So change that conversation over to plasma chains is um, working well. So once we've gotten past that point, and now we're talking about architecture, um, there's a few little pieces that we use. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the serverless um, pieces that we usually use. I'll flip over to Cal for demos and a bunch of stuff. Then we'll go back to me to continue this. But um, to connect the glue between the blockchain side and the traditional enterprise backends, um, we've got some glue in the middle. Uh, so we've got two of them, which are serverless-based programming. We've got uh, Azure Functions, which is functions as a service. So take a piece of code and it will run as a serverless style. Uh, so that's great. We've also got Logic Apps. Um, Logic Apps, I've got another screen in a second. So it is a serverless compute, but you don't have to write a code, you can just drag in uh, building blocks. And then the last one is um, Event Grid, which is an enterprise pub sub. So that's a great way of um, publishing, hey, something happened in the blockchain, <coughs> it out to your enterprise um, event grid, then any backend systems that care that something happened in the blockchain, we can subscribe to those events and then do something. So update the reporting of the events of which it was just transferred. So, we use the, um, so these two um, and that. So between these two, if we have to uh, do some uh, tricky custom stuff, we use function. But anything simple, we usually just go with logic apps because we can get them done in one, two minutes. Uh, so logic apps are uh, building blocks. You click and drag things on there. Um, so it's great because when we jump to an enterprise, um, we can build out entire demos in two, three days by using simple building blocks. Uh, we can just have when a smart contract event happens, so like an oracle, sit there and monitor. When something happens, go and do something. In this case, send an email. So if you get anyone to do one of those, hit go and it's deployed out. Um, inside of it, these logic app connectors, we can do a few things. We've got triggers, so like oracles when something happens. So we now have um, serverless, codeless enterprise oracles, which is pretty cool. Um, and actions want to do when something happens. So we can um, trigger um, a smart contract deployment, we can trigger um, executing a function on a smart contract, we can do um, a call on a transaction and pull back properties from uh, smart contracts. Uh, so this is what it looks like. If I want to read or write to a blockchain, um, it's usually this. So what I love doing with developers, uh, with new, new teams, um, I get them to uh, code out a, a smart contract so that takes them a few minutes to we'll see how do. And once I've done that, we can just go and enable them to go and trigger these smart contracts of this uh, click dragging, HTTP endpoint, click drag, um, go and call the smart contract, click drag, do a HTTP response passing back a JSON payload. And so that takes about five minutes and then the prior developer has started building some, building some things. Um, so that one's reading and writing. 
and then we have those um, serverless oracles. So um, put, you just copy and paste in the smart contract address, uh, select which event you want, because it's got that from the ABI, and then say what you want to do. Go and um, update your SQL database, publish it out to the suppliers, <coughs> and then you can help So, with that, <coughs> So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, as David said, I'm on the engineering team working on developer experience. And one of the big things we've been doing there is uh, Visual Studio Code, so improving developer productivity, uh, making this a much easier process for you know new users, but also not trying to get in the way of advanced users. Um, so somebody who knows what they're doing in, with these tools, we want to make sure that that still is frictionless, um, but we want to break down the walls for like new users, uh, somebody coming into the secret system. Sometimes it's not quite as approachable as uh, you might think. So looking at the current developer experience, you know, there's obviously some development component there, as David mentioned. Things like writing smart contract builds your app. But along with that then becomes the second block, which is a huge uh, kind of area for a new user to say, what do I use to build this app? Uh, in many ways, we've had that with other frameworks and, and programming languages before, but you know, the blockchain specifically is very open source in nature. Uh, there's a lot of awesome tools out there, uh, and there's some things that maybe aren't so awesome, right? So people trying to find the right tool for the right job uh, has been a struggle. Uh, we've seen a lot with people using these. So one of the motivations for even getting into developer experience was can we improve that process, make it easier for people to get their job done, uh, and then they can grow and learn as they're building new stuff so they can faster. The second thing was, how can we hook this up to infrastructure? So if we're deploying to a public node or a private node, uh, we want to break that wall down too. Uh, a lot of times we did these hackathons early on in the last few years, and I can tell you that where the stumbling blocks happen is not coming up with ideas and getting things there. It'll be like, how do we do a transaction? Like, you know, everybody knows the theory of like how this happens, but when the, the rubber meets the road and they have to use Web3.js or they have to use some of these tools, they start getting confused right away and then you know things start to fall apart and they lose productivity. And so one of the things there was how can we connect uh, these ledgers in a much more seamless fashion and then also help in the deployment. Um, so as you are starting to put new things out there, people are starting to get used to immutable smart contracts and transactions. How can we help that process as well? So that's those are the main motivations for why uh, we even got involved in this. So from a, an integrated development experience, if you look at the left side of this and we move to the right, uh, on the left side we basically are saying like in most languages and in most programming uh, structures that we have, we have the idea of a create new project, right? Uh, not just a hello world, but like letting me scaffold out a real structure that I would actually use. Uh, I don't just want some example or something like that, I just want to get started and do my thing. So this is one piece we wanted to nail. Creating ledgers, how can we do that from inside the IDE? Uh, we don't, another issue that comes up is there's a lot of different service providers. Azure's a big one, uh, but there's many other ones, right? And so it's like, okay, I need a ledger after I create my stuff, then I gotta bounce out to a website, now uh, there's Facebook, and there goes my productivity, right? Um, so, you know, keeping someone engaged in the IDE is really beneficial for the programmer to stay involved and say, like, if you wanna go deploy this, okay, I keep my same mindset. If I start context switching, I got issues. Uh, so then I can't get my job that fast. And the automatic configuration, as I mentioned before, so we want to take what we're building, take where we're going to deploy to, and help build that configuration on the fly for you. Um, so that you don't have to like waste your time with configuration files. Certainly they're there, and you can go tweak them and, and do what you need to. But most times, you just want to get through it. Let's get this thing running and see what's broken, and see how I can get this thing improved. The middle box is the IDE, and Part of this is like Microsoft and you know bringing our IDE like a Visual Studio Code this example is one aspect of it, but trying to like take over this market and say we're going to build the, the best debugger, we're going to build the best packager, this is not something that's going to happen, right? Because uh, there's such a huge community around this that's building awesome stuff. And so really we see ourselves as more of a connecting tool to say who are the best guys doing these things or who are the, the most popular ones that we can work with and get them integrated, help them get their stuff integrated there so that we can build a better tool. Uh, and so in this case, one of the first ones that we worked with was Truffle. Um, we've got a great relationship with Tim and, and the group there. Uh, we work very closely with Consensus and uh, Visual Studio Code with uh, Juan Blanco. Uh, we work very closely with the Ethereum Foundation on Remix. 
Uh, and there's others that are not mentioned here. So we've been actively working with the foundation to bring even more of the people building DevTools into this ecosystem. So if there's anybody in here building DevTools, certainly come see me at the booth or, or my group uh, and talk to us because we're very interested. We want to make sure that as we're building this tooling, we're doing it in such a way it's not like tightly coupled to one of these uh, kind of frameworks. We'd much rather it be open and let people have choice uh, and just help the user get started. And then on the right side is uh, basically the ledger technology. So like after we build something, we have this cool IDE to actually do it. Uh, what, where are we deploying these things to? Certainly one of the things to get started, and if I'm on a plane or if I'm disconnected, I want to do something local. I don't want to have to go spin up a huge network and waste a bunch of money just to see if my smart contract's working functionally. Uh, if I run my automated tests or you know, some of the other vendors we're working with, like Mitbex, some of the security vendors, we want to make sure that stuff's all working and we can test that stuff on local dev before we even go out to a big chain uh, to do something, whether it be private or public. Uh, we mentioned the private consortiums. And this tool is not tightly coupled to Azure. Uh, certainly Azure's uh, a nice experience in here, but certainly you could also plug this into uh, existing nodes if you had them running on premises or something of that nature. So don't think of this. I, I did hear some feedback. People say, well, it's got Azure in there, and that scares me, you know, because I'm not into the cloud or Azure. Uh, you know, it's totally to work without Azure, right? Azure's just a great place to run your stuff. Uh, but if you just want to run this stuff locally, or you actually want to run it on premises, you can also use that as well. And which brings us to the third box, which is a, a service we announced in May, which is called the Azure Blockchain Service. So don't take away, if you don't know anything about this, we're not building a ledger ourselves. Um, so this is powered by Quorum, and essentially what this is, is for some users <coughs> to say, I trust you enough that you can run my nodes for me, uh, just run my nodes for me as a pass service, as opposed to me having a VM that I have to maintain there and manage. You can still do the VM stuff, so if people want to have their hands on all the, the internals and make sure that that works, totally fine, you can run that. This is something that's a, a little bit faster, um, so maybe you can even use it for dev test. Certainly in production, people want to use this because there's a highly available solution here. So basically, we're making sure those nodes are healthy and running. Uh, you can think about other services who do something similar where they're hosting the nodes for you. This is Microsoft's version of that. And then on the public side, uh, you know, we, we talked about this because we don't want to build any barriers in here. Certainly, Microsoft's uh, bread and butter is enterprise, uh, and having these big enterprises engage in blockchain technology but we also don't want to sever off anybody from the public side. They should also use this tool, and we want to make sure that it's amenable to them as well. And so on the public side, um, something we're launching this week um, that we haven't kind of talked about yet is uh, working with Infura. Um, so we've been working with them for some time, but we wanted to smooth that process out much more for Infura. So I'll show you what it looks like from the Azure Blockchain Service. Infura is nearly identical. Um, so essentially, it's down to a couple clicks and you can have yourself in Infura without having to jump to any other website, even if you're new to Infura. Uh, so we made some really nice integration there to make that work for public networks. And I know there's other vendors we've been talking to as well who also are in this and we want to work with you guys too because the architecture is built to plug other you know, node providers into that. So this is kind of like our honeycomb, we call it, which basically looks like the stickers on people's laptops. but. Basically, just some of the, the key points I wanted to hit on. I hit on some of these earlier, but just hit on most of them. You know, we have the, the Azure Blockchain Service Integration Foundry Project. We have all the language syntax and linting compilation, those things happening. We have a debugger built in there. You can see that as well. I'll show you that. Any kind of different chain that you want to deploy to. We're working on something for the fork chain. Um, so if you guys are familiar with the work Truffle's been doing in that space, this is pretty interesting. So you can have your production environment, which could even be a public blockchain. Uh, or it could be a private one that's in production. You can essentially fork that chain, make your changes to your code, test it. Yep, everything's working. Destroy your fork, push your changes up to the public, or push your new contract to public. Uh, so we want to automate that a little bit more. We definitely have it working. So the smart contract test execution I mentioned, some vendors are working with there. We're also working with like some wallet uh, vendors as well. Truffle's one of them. We've been working with them to improve the Truffle HD wallet experience. Uh, also, Fortis is another one that we're working with uh, in the wallet space to, to improve that. We also have these like logic app flow integration. David was talking about some of these serverless things. And I'll show you what we've, we've done in Visual Studio Code to help that out. Basically, if you build a smart contract and you want to like interoperate with it, we have a contract interaction, we call it. 
which basically built a UI on the fly for you so that you can test your contract and start like playing with it to see if it's working. But then on top of that, you know, I want to wrap that in a serverless function. So the, the functions are really, these logic apps and functions are really just like CRUD operations to a blockchain. Right? We, just, we want to send a transaction in, we want to read some data, we want to react to an event. It's pretty basic. So what we did in VS Code was said, well, if you built your smart contract out, we know what methods you have in there, so we can basically wrap that with a logic app, give you that as an output. You don't have to write any code. Uh, you can basically pop that into you know, our logic app service. <coughs> Business developers, what we call them, someone who doesn't write a lot of code, can even use that, because it's basically like connections that they're forming up there, so it's super easy to do that. The extension and, and this stuff, definitely see us if you need help finding it, but if you just search for Visual Studio Marketplace, Blockchain, or Ethereum, you'll find it. This is a short link to it. Uh, we launched this back in May, and uh, yeah, we've got good feedback. It's all open source. You can go look at all our code up there. Uh, we do monthly builds right now, or monthly publishes. And like I said, this week we're doing one. Uh, I'll show you some another vendor we're working with that we're gonna we put some new stuff in for this one today. And then also, this is just the experience, but we'll walk through that in a second. And with that, I'm going to pop into actually doing some work here with the Studio. <laughs> So let me pop into a fresh console here. So this is just VS Code out of the box. For those who are getting started, uh, if you just go download this tool, just go search for it. Uh, when you come in here, you can search for these. This is a little extensions. So these are things that augment the extension thing. And you can just type in blockchain, uh, and you'll find a bunch of them in here. And we're like right here. Um, I already have it installed. And so basically, once you install it, you'll see this little thing comes up over here. Now, I already have one pre-connected here. Uh, this is one talking to Azure, but I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, I basically opened a folder here. It's just empty right now. And I brought up the command palette. The command palette is like basically all the commands that we can do with these tools. Um, and we can add new ones to them, but right here is what we do right now. So we have our file new project. I'll show you a debugging transaction flow. We fully integrated the debugger into the IDE, so you can do all the step through, step out of. You can do the inspection, even down to the instruction level. Um, so you can see all the IL and everything that's going on there. We do uh, the deployments, the builds, you know, all the compilation that's happening there. We can connect and create new networks up here. I'll show you what those look like. Uh, we have some things for key management that you can do in there, and then some stuff with Ganache. So if we basically just do a new one, you can see when I do a new project. Now, if I was a user that doesn't know what the heck I'm doing, if I just keep hitting enter, I'm going to get a nice scaffolded out project. If I know what I'm doing and I want to go out and say, that, hey, there's another truffle box I want to use or something like that, I can do that as well. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to take the default and put it, put it in the same folder. We'll pray to the internet gods here uh, because <laughs> the network is not great here, but it's okay. I have the uh, cooking show demo in case this fails. But basically what we're doing here is we've created a template. Um, if you're familiar with truffle boxes, uh, is one package format that we're using. And so basically we scaffold it out and put the right stuff out here for what people should be doing when they're doing one of these. Um, so we have a, a basic you know, project structure, we have you know, our open source licenses and stuff in here, all the normal stuff that people would need. Uh, and then basically you can see as it went through, it just went and pulled this box down. It's already dissolving all the dependencies. So in our case we're using a wallet. Um, so we needed to install some node dependencies. So when you do this yourself, you'll see that it kind of hangs here as it's doing something. What it's doing is just going and getting all the packages that we need and doing it for you. Again, you can customize this. You can jump out to a terminal and do whatever you need to here if you're uh, in the know and know what you're doing with this stuff. But if you don't know what you're doing, this will help you get to the good state. Um, so we'll just give that a few seconds here. And <coughs> finish up. There it is. So as that finishes, basically we have our <coughs> Uh, Hello World, we have our migrations, we already have all the migrations set up for us. If we look at our Truffle config, let me minimize some things here, we automatically threw a development environment in here for you. We have Ganache baked into the IDE, so if you don't do anything else, it'll automatically just work uh, in a disconnected fashion. We also inject the hardware provider and the HD law provider, and you'll see what that means here in a second when we start talking to other networks. So the first thing you'd want to do is just you know, do a basic build. Um, this is in preview, so you'll see a lot of these debug commands. We, maybe we can minimize this, but we put this out here so that people can see what's happening there in case there's any breaks within this tooling uh, while we're in preview. 
But basically, you can see it just did a compilation um, on our projects. And then if we do a deploy, you'll notice when we do a deploy, we basically get this little drop down here. Now, what's cool about this, what we built here was, you can see it says from Truffle config.js. So basically, in the Truffle config, remember, we had that development one by default that we just for you. And there's also one from the tree over here, because I already have one registered. So as I build up more over here, right now Azure's here, let's see if you're uh, listed over here. You can also do local networks and things over here. And again, if there's any <coughs> people in the audience who are uh, working on you know, ledger infrastructure, we'd love to plug you guys in there as well. Architecture is very open, so we can just basically extend these. And then they basically show up for the user just as choices. So again, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to go get RPC endpoints and figure out like how to authenticate to those things. That's happening for them. And I'm happy to talk through that in detail. If you want to come by the booth, I can tell you how we're kind of doing that securely um, to make that work. But for instance, let's just go to the local ganache. Let's say I just want to do something quickly because I'm a developer. I just want to try this out. So you can see I do my deployment. We can see all our logs here. And we got our build folders. Everything came out. Now the next step we said was, well, once you get to this stage, you know, if they're a new user, they're like, well, that's great. Like, everything worked. How do I, like, work with this thing? Uh, I didn't build a DAP yet. I just want to, like, work with it. And so in this case, they can drop to a command line and do that. But then they're going to have to go read. Uh, and hopefully they know how to read. And they will read. But, you know, they're trying to get things done quickly. So we say, okay, we created this contract interaction page. Minimize some things. So this is a React application that's inside of here. It basically is then reading our uh, contracts. So this is dynamic. This knows what methods are in there. So there's only two methods in my contract. Send request and send response. Uh, it has the deployment. So if I do multiple, this drop-down list will fill up. Uh, it also has a bunch of metadata, like where did this thing get deployed to from, all the address detail. You can copy and paste bytecode and API if you need them uh, as you start building your application. So we thought that might be a good thing. And then you can actually interact with them. So if I said test request, I execute, you can see the state filled up. Now I'll show you in a second that it's not smoke and mirrors. That actually went to Ganache right now. Um, and we will do that as we'll do a debug. Um, but you can also see if we get a response message. <coughs> do a response. And you see that one filled in. So this is basically showing the state. And these are all your actions that are inside of there. Now I mentioned, like, this is not smoke and mirrors. So if we pull up our uh, command files again and go into a debug transaction, if you look really closely, maybe you can't see it in the back, but we give you a hint. These are all the transactions that have happened recently. Uh, and you can see there, this is send response, and this one was send request. I just did those two. So if you click on this, <coughs> we'll basically launch a debug session for you. Um, we'll enumerate everything back here at the transaction level, block level. You can get all those details. You can expand this stuff to your heart's content to look at it. Uh, if you start jumping in here with your function keys as normal, uh, you'll see it was send response that we actually called there. You can see our response message. We can hover and see those. Um, so really nice like debugging interface. It actually breaks down even into the instruction level, as I mentioned before. So if you're a public developer, you might be concerned about you know what's happening here. There's store calls happening. You can see all that stuff directly in the IDE here. So we think that's a pretty nice thing for uh, users who are like trying to figure out what's broken in their contract really quickly uh, from the IDE. So we jump back to say, okay, our typical flow was we, we did something locally there, we've deployed it, everything seems to be good, now we're going to put another chain. Now in my case, I already, already connected to an Azure blockchain service. How I did that, I can connect to or create a network here. Um, so if I say connect to, and let's say I did go to Azure, by the way, uh, this week Infura will show up in the drop down as well, so uh, the same experience will happen for Infura. And then basically you can pick your subscription, in Azure, it's very context sensitive to a subscription and a resource group. Uh, in Infura, it would basically list your projects here. Right? So you can pick your project that you had up there and get your endpoints back. In this case, it will see what consortiums are up there. In my case, I'm already connected to that one, so I could create a new one. Um, it'll go out and do everything for me. I don't even have to go to like, any other portals or websites. It will spin up the consortium for me. It takes a few minutes, so we won't do that right now. Uh, if you expand this, you'll see that we, uh, in the context of Azure, we have our consortium, our member, and our transaction node. If you right-click on the transaction node, you can see we can get to our RPC address. Again, if you're building an app, you typically need that. Like, as soon as you start like writing some JavaScript code or something like that, you're going to need that. You can just grab this and put it right in your clipboard. You can use it. You can all disconnect if we're not using this consortium anymore. It'll still keep it there. We're just basically disconnecting from it. The exact same thing happens with Infura, except for, and I wish I could show you here, but uh, we'll just 
just publishing it actually right now. But it'll basically show you all the nodes underneath there for the different networks, whether it be Rothstein, RinkB, you know, mainnet, those kind of things. Same experience. Um, and then basically whenever we go to deploy to that, it's the same process. So once this comes up on deployment, we would pick this guy. Um, and if I pull up the Apple's window. Now, you'll notice in this case, whenever I hit a network that's not local, I need a mnemonic. So I can either generate a new one here, or I can use one that I have existing, uh, which is here on disk. So we initially, to give you some feedback here, initially we wanted to make this super easy again for users to say, I don't even know what mnemonic is. They can generate their prompt from a file location. They can put it in USB drive or wherever. It's going to get enough like from a security perspective. So what we've been doing is working with our Truffle HD wallet provider so that we can provide two options. One is have this uh, an encrypted file wherever you want to put that thing. The other one is using a real HSM. Um, so we have an HSM in Azure. Uh, there are others that exist out there. But basically you can choose to use an HSM to hold that mnemonic, that secret, um, so that it can't get compromised on the field disk. Something uh, we're actively working on. But if I put a mnemonic in here and I look at my output window, You'll see it, it's a little bit slower because it's going over the network, uh, but it'll eventually uh, push this stuff. You can see we say deploying down here, and you can see it's deploying to a different network here, uh, and eventually that will complete. So just make it super easy. I didn't have to write any code, any migrations, and I'm able to deploy it directly to other chains. We think that's pretty cool um, for what uh, people need to use here. Now another thing that's, uh, while that's finishing up, uh, on this menu, uh, a couple things. One is we just talked about these logic apps. So this bottom menu section here is basically uh, covering those things. So if I want to wrap one of these contracts in a serverless application, I can pick this, I can pick what I want to do. Logic <coughs> app, flow app, Azure function. Uh, I'll sh give you a link to the documentation. You can look at how these things actually work. We would put a contract address, really. Uh, so this one's still the point, but I can just say, I'll put a fake one in for now. And then basically we'll pick, uh, because this one's in Azure, where am I going to close And you can see it generated a logic app. Now what does that mean? It basically generated a bunch of JavaScript for me uh, that already pre-fills everything in for me. So basically it went and looked at all my methods, it looked at what state variables exist out there, it created a wrapper for that, and basically put that out in JSON, and I can version that now, put it in my source control, and then I can take that up to Azure. And it will build what David showed you on the screen before, that's that GUI. It will build that automatically for you. Um, so it makes it super easy for people to build applications, whether it be event-based or CRUD, like I want to read or create something inside of there. So the other thing um, that I know that you might have noticed whenever I was going through these menus really fast was, in your contracts, one of the things people want to do is, like, some of this stuff's already been solved, right? Um, Anybody who knows these folks, Open Zeppelin, knows that uh, they have a pretty nice set of libraries up there um, that people have typically use for production applications that have been fully vetted, rock solid contracts for different things. And so we said, how could we improve that experience, right? So the typical flow we saw with enterprises was, I'll go do an NPM package, go ahead and pull all the Open Zeppelin contracts. The problem is uh, that we saw with some of the customers was, like, why is it pulling down everything? Like, I just want to do an ERC-20 or an ERC-721. I just need some math libraries. I don't need all this other stuff. So then I have to go delete it and make sure no one does an NPM install so then I end up with stuff in my uh, directory that I didn't want. So one of the things we were talking to the Open Zeppelin guys about was could we create like categories similar to what they have with their folder structure that selectively allow me to just pull these down and then resolve all the dependencies for me. So if I just want the math or the lifecycle stuff or the uh, access control stuff, I can pull just those. Um, and I'll show you what it looks like for the token here. So what this is actually doing is going and grabbing a specific version uh, of the uh, Open Zeppelin contracts, and it pulled down 15 files in this case, and I'll show you what they look like. But it also gives me this little more details thing here that I can click on, and this will take me directly to this rich documentation. So if I'm new to the ERC, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I can come up here, this will walk me through everything I need to know about what I'm doing with that. A couple other things that we're doing there is you can see it downloaded the contracts, obviously. Uh, it resolved all the dependencies for these things. So anything that's, uh, you know, these things have multiple dependencies on inside each one of these. Um, so that's happening automatically. It's also making them read only. So one of the things in, in talking with Open Zeppelin was, you know, sometimes people inadvertently make changes to these then. And then that could introduce a security problem and that's not good. 
And uh, so I said, well, first off, we can make them read-only. But that's not good enough, right? Because somebody could just make them not read-only. So what we did is uh, look at the actual commit hash and look at the, uh, the file hash up in GitHub. And so we know for sure, so when we do a deployment, we actually check that. And so like every time somebody does a deployment, no matter where it is, we actually block it right now and say, someone changed one of the core contracts right here is the one that they changed, go fix it. Uh, so we won't let it go forward. We're thinking about letting them tweak that, but the model that uh, Open Zeppelin has shared is really good, which is using inheritance as opposed to changing those core contracts. And so we want to kind of make a firm stance there to make sure people don't uh, blow their leg off, you know, with this kind of stuff. So basically this will automatically do a verification check now every time I do a deployment and make sure that no one changed these and then I can start extending that. It also created the migration for me. So this is kind of cool too, like we went and looked at what all the dependencies are and built the uh, migration file for you. So again, you don't have to write any code. If you just downloaded an ERC20 and hit go, it will take care of everything and migrate it for you. Um, I'll just be totally honest, there's a couple breaks in this, this is brand new. Um, and some of those are around like, some of the contracts actually need parameters to initialize themselves, like a, in the constructor or something. And so we're thinking about a better experience for that. Happy to hear feedback from anyone here too, but we're thinking about integrating that as well to say, hey, in order to use the ERC20, I need to know what you want to name it or what the supply is or something like that. Then we can prompt them for that and then do it for them so that they don't have to dig around inside these contracts. And so I think that's pretty much all I wanted to show. And I'm happy that afterwards we can talk through anything here. And I'm happy to talk about the internal <coughs> of this stuff and how it works. And uh, you know, like the new stuff's going live this week. Um, so we're actually in the process right now of getting this published. And this will have the Open Zeppelin stuff in it, as well as the uh, Tempura stuff. And this extension works on Windows, Mac, Linux? Yeah, those three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cross platform, so. And do you want to jump into the slides? Yeah, so that's something important. Um, when I go and work with these customers, I'll usually have a bunch of. Uh, half the devs in the room will have uh, Windows laptops, and the other half will have Mac laptops. So being able to have everyone using the exact same Visual Studio Code tooling with the same extension makes it easy for all the devs to um, have the same workflow. One other thing I wanted to talk about, so beyond just like uh, the scaffolding and stuff that we put out there today, there's also this thing, and people sometimes get confused because we're horrible at naming things, uh, but it's okay, uh, so I'll talk you through it. So basically the Azure Blockchain Dev Kit, part of that is this Visual Studio Code extension, but another part of it is this GitHub repo, this open source, that has a bunch of code samples up here, a bunch more advanced stuff on serverless functions, there's a lot of documentation to help you get started on all this stuff. So once you get beyond the initial stuff and you want to start diving into more of the complex flows, um, this is something cool to look at. The other side was uh, last ethereal, not the one in Tel Aviv, but before in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn, we actually did a uh, our first bounties project with Microsoft actually, we did a $20,000 worth of bounty. And basically what we did is proposed out uh, 20 different projects for people to work on to build different things using our HSN, using some serverless functions. There's a whole slew of them, there's some around gaming and tokenization. And basically uh, those are up there as well. Uh, it was super great response, we were super happy to was working with Git to get point on that. And uh, it worked out really well, but we basically have this community driven section now too. So we have the Microsoft samples that we're producing, we have the community-driven ones that we're you know, kind of vetting and working with the community on, but happy to take more contributions up there if you guys, on either side, pull requests or welcome anywhere. I, the links are here, but you can come by our booth. I think that's David. Yeah, I think that's David. Okay, so for the last 15 minutes, I'm going to go and take everything that we've talked about and then try to remix into a few different uh, things. So as I said, um, we dive in and everything that I do with the customers is exactly what Dale just showed you. So we showed them from the beginning how to go scaffold, a, scaffold out a brand new project, uh, get them to learn how to add in a few functions into the smart contracts, show them how to debug, how to write unit tests, um, oh yeah, you didn't show the unit testing. Yeah, it's there. Um, <laughs> And once I've gotten through that, again, it's the um, getting uh, what we've done on the blockchain glued up to what's happening in the enterprise. So um, I run through how it works for a single member inside the consortium. Then we go um, 
zoom out and see how it looks when we can bring them all together. So for one enterprise, at the core of everything is Truffle and Visual Studio Code. So we use that to go do um, all the writing, the unit testing, debugging, all of that stuff. So, um, so they're doing that uh, locally. They've got, um, this is their blockchain code. So from their blockchain code, we start doing things so that their backends can do what Cal was talking about with this crap. So here we've got those logic apps. So as Cal showed, um, so I used to go and get them to do it by hand because it only took five minutes. <coughs> so I click, drag in, visual designer. But as Kale showed you now, it takes 10 seconds. Because you now just right click the smart contract, say please just uh, generate it for me. Generates out that JSON file, um, which defines that logic app for you. So you can just go and copy and paste that logic app um, JSON file, now up into Azure, and bam, you now have your uh, serverless CRUD to go into the blockchain. But once we've got that, then the enterprise can start looking at things up to it. So they can have their <coughs> intranet app, and the intranet app can just go and the enterprise devs, all they care about now is that they have a REST endpoint. So a REST endpoint to go and do some reading and writing, pushing in the um, transactions. Um, so there are things that we can do around locking this down um, through Azure configuration, so people outside the company can't access it. That's probably a good idea. Um, but it helps them use this as just a standard REST endpoint, instead of worrying about uh, Web3 JS, JS and um, caring about signing transactions. So we do all of that signing and that inside of here. Uh, that way, when something happens on a SQL server, we can go and push that down, so it updates the blockchain. We keep on doing this stuff, um, Azure Function, and um, other things happen. Uh, power apps, so the same thing how uh, we showed how you can do uh, codeless serverless. We've got codeless UI. Uh, so we can go and just uh, scaffold out a really quick um, prototype but within a week when we push together all of this, we just get them to do a codeless UI, go and call the rest endpoint. So that's on the reading and writing side. But if someone else goes and updates the blockchain, we have to react to it. So we have the adventure of the stuff on the other side. So again this that that was that um, serverless oracle. Um, from a serverless oracle push it into um, event grid, so the event grid, whatever it cares about can up subscribe through PubSub. Um, so if another member updates uh, the orders for widgets, then the event comes up here, our Oracle detects it, uh, publishes it, and then we can go and update our backend SQL Server. We can update um, Power BI, um, reports that for you. Or we can go and trigger us another one to go and trigger our um, action process to go and start constructing, constructing widgets for someone. Someone requested it. So, this one enterprise can go and build whatever they want and it's inside of their infrastructure. Um, but if you go and zoom out, then it looks like this. So one enterprise can do what they want, but because the blockchain is that shared state and shared source of truth, now all the other enterprises just react uh, off of that. So each of them can have whatever backend systems that they want, but as long as this is a source of truth, everything works well. Um, so again, the way that we go and teach them about this is it's all <coughs> basic um, theory and fundamentals. What works here, we can then go and remix it, like the slides in the way, um, to say a B to C. So they can still do what they want with their key management, with their oracles, etc. But if they're doing a B to C app, they can still have the consumers um, interact with it. So we can do it in two different ways. Um, the first way enterprises usually want to do it is even once we get them past this point, they still usually want to control like um, the keys for the users. Um, so it may have some mobile apps, etc. Um, so the end users, once they're logging into the or something, um, can go for the logic app to go and um, push in transactions, updates, etc. Um, but the keys are stored here. So that's probably going to be step one as we migrate these enterprises across as they're getting more and more confident. And then hopefully we'll get up to something like this. But we're using um, centralized IDs, with, um, the end customers are using their own keys, but it's okay. The enterprises still have um, all their stuff as it was. So again, everything we're teaching here is making sure that um, they're good enterprise devs, but also good public DAP devs. Um, so once we start getting closer to rolling this out in production, then we need to start having to worry about a few so um, how to go and add members. Um, so because we're usually using Quorum, that's usually accounted for us. Um, so Quorum and Azure 
blockchain service um, has some great mechanisms there for how to go and add vendors in, vote for the, all the governance around that. But also on the development side, um, this is where it gets tricky. And we've actually released a white paper around how we, uh, some suggested ways to enterprises can do this. If you do a search for Microsoft uh, blockchain DevOps white paper, uh, then you can find it. So if you do have three companies, um, who, or three, five, ten companies working together in this one consortium, um, how do we go and manage everything around uh, updating the source code, updating smart contracts, deploying them out? Um, we've got some things around the, dev around the DevOps there. Um, so we can do things like, um, inside of Azure DevOps, whenever we have a pull request, we can say that we need to have an approval from each of the consortium members before that pull request is allowed to come in and update the source code. Um, same thing with deploying that now. Uh, we can go and have multi-seek wallet, so each of the consortium members have to go and uh, sign off before that new deployment can go and happen. So, um, I've got a bunch of different examples, but um, here's one which is here um, local in Japan. Uh, so here in Japan, we're working with um, a couple of companies um, to create a new consortium. We've got uh, Japan Rail Ease, Mizuho Bank, uh, Japan Rail um, Information Services, uh, some insurance companies, etc. Um, so the idea here is enabling um, ability as a service, trying to help customers get from point A to point B, but they go through multiple different uh, service providers. As some of you may have seen while you've been in Japan, you may have had to go on Japan Rail, but then a Shinkansen, maybe take your underground, jump into a bus. So the idea here is now having one system uh, that end customers can end up using. And so the first prototype for this we got up and running um, in three four days because we were using the VS Code extensions, the scaffolding out um, all of the service applications here. Um, you can see here, maybe not because it's Japanese, but we've got um, ERC20 tokens, ERC721 tokens, because we're just using industry standards, Open Zeppelin, to go and scaffold those out for us. Um, we're using the serverless oracles to go and detect when things were happening, so we can update the reports so we can show how many customers are using the tickets, um, etc. So there are many different ways to go and mash up these things. Um, so here we've got the interconnect between Mizuho Bank's traditional backend systems. Um, so we've got the open banking API to handle customer accounts. So how do we go and connect that in with the blockchain? So again, we use those serverless applications to allow a customer to click something, do, some, do something serverless, which goes and updates the ERC20 balances, etc., etc. Um, so then we went back, and then in another four days, we went and uh, smashed together another few scenarios. So again, we've got more ERC20, 721s, things happen. Um, but again, everything that we're doing here is helping make sure it's all blockchain fundamentals. So for example, up here, around um, key management, so we're looking around how can we do this with decentralized identity. But we want to make sure that the IDs can be used in other places as well. Um, so I've been very careful with what I've said because this is all still um, shush, shush. But um, that picture of that picture is in the official press release. So I'm allowed to talk about that, but not much, not much more. <laughs> else I'm allowed to talk about. No, I don't want to get, I don't want to get fired. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that was one cut for example. Um, so to show another way that we can uh, mash these up. Um, so another way to mash these up. Um, so actually we've done this pattern at a few customers now. Um, if we've got uh, high, high frequency IoT data coming in, so if we've got IoT devices sending in uh, millions of transactions per second, how can we handle that and secure it? So we obviously can't put millions of transactions per second into a blockchain. Um, so what we did was we wanted to help give um, auditors who came in after the fact confidence that the IoT data hadn't been tampered with. <coughs> what we ended up doing was we could have millions of IoT devices streaming in their data into um, what we call an event hub. So this can handle millions of transactions per second coming in. Um, so it's kind of like a pub sub. Uh, all these millions of transactions we stream out to immutable, immutable block storage. So this is all ISO standard 
stuff. So to show that IoT data has been persistent with the minimal blobs, which is great while still inside my Azure subscription. But as soon as I try, um, and I can see that it hasn't been modified, but as soon as I try to um, share that raw data to an auditor, I could still modify it while it's in transit. So how can we uh, make them confident around it? So we periodically, once it's in a beautiful block storage, it can't be changed. So we go and every minute or 10 minutes, whatever we want, um, go and take the hash of those millions of transactions which are sitting there and go and anchor that into a blockchain somewhere. Um, so we've actually gone and thrown that up onto GitHub. Uh, here goes, that one, that one GitHub. So we've got pictures, we've got source code, etc. Um, look, we just did this um, quickly, we threw it together. Um, next month, um, Microsoft, we're doing a little internal uh, hackathon. So I'm going to get a few people to work with me to uh, build out this documentation a little bit nicer. So we'll have some better quick start guides there. Now, all of the stuff that I just showed, so one really important link here. Um, so we did the same talk at TruffleCon. <coughs> Um, so the link there is uh, Truffle 2019. So if you go aka.ms um, slash Truffle 2019, um, you've got a lot of the core things that I just talked about here in a nice readme file. So we've got everything that I've talked about, the core tenets of blockchain first development, pretty pictures that you can steal, um, some information about what the connectors are, links to VS Code extensions, etc. Let's bring it back up. So that's the important point there. Um, now with that, um, so Microsoft, we do have a vendor uh, booth. What's that on? Basement. Yeah. Basement? There you go. So go down to the basement. You can go talk to uh, Microsoft. That sounds weird. Go down to the basement and speak with Microsoft about um, how cool developers are. But yeah, we're out of time. So thanks, everyone.